After 20 years of endless war, the US has finally withdrawn from Afghanistan. The Taliban takeover of Afghanistan is complete and the Afghan government has fallen. How could it go so wrong? Why did the US mission fail and why did the Afghan army collapse in a matter of weeks? And now that they're back in power, what will a Taliban-controlled Afghanistan look like in the face of multiple ISIS-K attacks and continued resistance in the Panjshir Valley? Is another anti-Taliban insurgency on the way? And which geopolitical players will step in to fill the power vacuum left behind by the United States? All that in this video. Just before we start, don't forget to subscribe for more political analysis videos and hit that bell notification while you're at it. Graveyard of Empires that statement has become an overused cliché, but it couldn't be more accurate to describe this situation. After $2.4 trillion spent, 2,500 Americans dead and 20,000 wounded, 66,000 Afghan soldiers dead, 50,000 civilians dead and 51,000 Taliban dead, all that was achieved was a Taliban stronger than ever before, now equipped with an air force and controlling more territory than they did in 2001. So after 20 years of Western intervention, how could the American-backed government fall so quickly? What went wrong? There are several reasons. For starters is the rampant corruption and subsequent failure to build state capacity or an effective military. After NATO forces ousted the Taliban in 2001, it was critical to build a government that was seen as legitimate in the eyes of the Afghan people. Yet the people the US chose for this were wholly unsuited to the task. With a rank of 165 on the Corruption Perceptions Index, Afghanistan is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Now, corruption existed before, but was worsened by the American policy of empowering and paying off warlords as the new power brokers in Afghanistan. These warlords depend on vast patronage networks to stay in power, and so both them and their subordinates depend on corruption in order to maintain their positions. In fact, Government positions become a commodity in and of themselves. People could buy their way into government offices, with the position of district police officer costing about $100,000. Now, in order to recoup that investment, officials demand bribes, and so corruption becomes a self-reinforcing mechanism. The influx of Western aid meant that there was more than enough money to steal. It also resulted in inflation. An economy with an annual GDP of 20 billion simply could not absorb the $145 billion in aid that it received between 2001 and 2021. As a result, inflation between 2003 and 2008 was 17.5%. This didn't only undermine the economy, it devalued the wages of government officials, and so to compensate, they demanded bribes to maintain their incomes. The inherent corruption of the Afghan state was further undermined by the lack of true democratic legitimacy. The few anti-corruption measures that did exist were mainly used to prosecute political rivals as opposed to fighting corruption generally. As for democratic elections, in a country with 17.5 million eligible voters, only 1.6 million bothered to vote and only about half of those voted for Ashraf Ghani. Not exactly a popular mandate. In fact, more Afghans voted in the TV show Afghan Star than in the national election. Adding to that, the 2019 elections were disputed with allegations of vote rigging and the opposition refusing to recognize the result. Without true democratic legitimacy, citizens stay loyal to families, clans and tribes who were a safer bet than the corrupt government that was just as likely to shake them down as to help them. The truth is that Afghanistan was a mafia state. Those in charge maintain their power not through modern institutions, but through personal family and tribal ties maintained by sharing the economic spoils with key warlords. This lack of legitimacy and corruption also seeped its way into undermining the war effort. It was standard practice for army commanders to inflate troop numbers so that they could claim the salaries of ghost soldiers and pocket the difference. In fact, in some cases, even real soldiers did not receive their salaries, leading to declining morale and mass desertions. Underpaid soldiers and corrupt commanders would regularly sell their American-supplied equipment to make money. And guess who bought that equipment? The Taliban. Large-scale corruption and the poor state of the Afghan forces meant that significant chunks of the Afghan war effort were wholly dependent on the Americans. Much of the Air Force and advanced weaponry could only be maintained by US technicians. When these left after Biden's withdrawal, 
the Afghan forces had no one to maintain their air force. The principal advantage they had over the Taliban was rendered useless. It was as if the carpet had been pulled out from under them. There were parts of the military that were capable. The Afghan special forces had been trained into an effective fighting force and did about 75% of the fighting against the Taliban. But while many Afghan soldiers were effectively trained in how to do the technical aspects of military operations, especially the special forces, there was no serious effort made to build the military institutions, logistics and bureaucracy to direct and maintain those trained soldiers. And aside from the special forces, the vast majority of the army were poor recruits who were only in it for the salary and nothing else. The fact that they were often never paid and the heavy losses suffered by Afghan forces meant that the Afghan army had to replace nearly a third of its forces every year simply due to casualties and desertions. It's no surprise then that the Pentagon deliberately began hiding data on the true state of the Afghan forces. Without anything but economic spoils and American funding to keep the regime afloat, it's no surprise that the army deserted and warlords switched sides in the face of a well-armed, well-organized and determined insurgent group. By the end of it, the government was so corrupt that most regional leaders simply cut deals with the Taliban and switched sides. But the truth is that this analysis assumes that this was even the primary goal of the American intervention. If we look at America's actions, it appears that they were more focused on keeping the Afghan government dependent on the American war machine than on creating a viable state. If we look back at the spending, we see that out of the 2.4 trillion spent in Afghanistan, 2 trillion went to just five top military contractors. Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, General Dynamics, Boeing, and Northrop Grumman. So we see that overwhelmingly, the American financial contribution in Afghanistan was not focused on building state capacity, but on enriching the military industrial complex at home. Hardly any money actually made it to Afghanistan. Most of it went straight back to Washington, D.C. In fact, out of the 2.4 trillion, the U.S. spent only 24 billion on economic development and 88 billion on the Afghan military. The next point of failure was the way the U.S. withdrew. The peace deal negotiated by Trump with the Taliban was negotiated without the involvement of the Afghan government. Essentially, the Taliban agreed not to attack NATO forces in exchange for their withdrawal, a promise they largely kept. The part of the deal they didn't keep was the part about not taking power by force. And so they proceeded to intensify their attacks against Afghan forces while taking care not to attack NATO troops. It also didn't help that as part of the deal, Trump pressured the Afghan government into freeing 5,000 Taliban prisoners who went on to join the fight. When the time came for Biden to execute the final phase of the withdrawal, it was like he pulled the carpet from under the Afghan government. When NATO forces left Bagram Air Base, they didn't even bother to tell the new Afghan commander. Essentially, the deal gave the Taliban the breathing room it needed to regroup and resupply. Free from US airstrikes, they could operate unchecked, and the withdrawal itself demoralized Afghan forces, causing fence-sitters who were already demoralized from lack of pay and corruption to take the easy way out. Undoubtedly, the American withdrawal was incredibly sloppy and haphazard, but ultimately, even a better organized withdrawal would have only delayed the inevitable. The final factor why the Taliban was able to persist is the clandestine support it received from the Pakistani ISI or Inter-Services Intelligence. The origins of the Taliban can be traced to Pakistan. During the Soviet war in Afghanistan back in the 1980s, Pakistan funded several Mujahideen groups to fight the Soviets. The Taliban originated from Afghan refugees in Pakistan who attended ultra-conservative Islamic schools known as madrasas. These schools offered food and free education and were funded by Saudi Arabia and taught an ultra-conservative fundamentalist version of Islam. Once the Soviet Union was defeated, the Mujahideen began fighting amongst each other. To stabilize its neighbor, the Pakistani ISI recruited students from these Islamic schools and gave them military training. In fact, the word Taliban means student in the Pashto language. Pakistan continued to support the Taliban when they took control of Afghanistan in 1996. There were three key reasons for this support. 
previous governments in Afghanistan had been pro-India and had challenged Pakistan's territorial integrity by refusing to recognize the so-called Durand Line and implying that the Pashtun-speaking regions of Pakistan should become part of Afghanistan where Pashtuns are the dominant ethnic group. It was hoped that by supporting the Taliban, they could prevent the rise of Indian influence in Afghanistan and that the Taliban, which was religiously rather than ethnically inspired, would renounce any territorial claims on Pakistani territory. Finally, they hoped to turn Afghanistan into a gateway to trade with Central Asia. But after 9-11, Pakistan had no choice but to renounce its support for the Taliban and join America in its war on terror. But even as its official policy supported the United States against the Taliban, unofficially the Taliban continued to receive covert support from Pakistan and the Taliban continued to operate out of the Pashtun-speaking regions of Pakistan. Because the US was dependent on Pakistan to supply their forces in Afghanistan, they could do little to punish the Pakistanis. Having such an unreliable ally was a key reason that the Taliban was able to survive after the initial 2001 invasion. The fact that the Taliban could freely cross the porous Afghan-Pakistan border allowed it to develop into the powerful insurgency that it became. Essentially, even though far more Taliban were killed than NATO forces, they had much more commitment and were able to outlast the US as America grew war-weary. The corruption and incompetence of the Afghan government and its military demoralized the army and the population. The Taliban had only to kick in the door and the whole rotten structure came crumbling down. So now that the Taliban is in power, what will Taliban rule look like and what will its policies be? Moderate extremists. The Taliban has launched an unprecedented charm offensive, trying to convince the world that it has left behind its extremist past and is ready to be a constructive member of the international community. Now obviously, this is a PR stunt to create a softer image of the Taliban. But how much softer will the Taliban really be? And what incentive do they have to follow through? The Taliban requires a veneer of legitimacy and respectability to gain international support and recognition. When it was previously in power, it was only recognized by three countries, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. Its hardline policies and support for international terrorists ensured that it was relegated to international isolation with no access to foreign investment, international institutions, or international finance. But with the current state of Afghanistan, it has a very strong incentive not to become an international pariah. 75% of Afghanistan's government budget is funded by foreign aid. If the Taliban wants to keep receiving at least some of that money, it will have to gain international recognition and play ball with international donors. On top of that, the United States has serious financial leverage over the Taliban. The US Federal Reserve controls $7 billion out of the Afghanistan Central Bank's $10 billion in assets. For now, the US has frozen those assets. America could use those reserves either to force the Taliban to play ball or they could give the money to what remains of the Afghan government to fund a resistance group. Either way, it gives incentive for the Taliban to play along. Adding to that, the IMF has control over Afghanistan's foreign exchange reserves and it will likely only release them once a significant number of countries have recognized the Taliban government. Until then, all these financial assets officially belong to what remains of the Afghan government. So there are cold, hard financial reasons for the Taliban not to be as extreme as in the past. But what does not as extreme mean in concrete terms? When it comes to the issue of terrorism, we will probably see the most moderation. It's unlikely that the Taliban will allow Afghanistan to be used as a base for international terrorism, as this would be the one thing that would invite severe retaliation by the United States. But it's not just the US. Recognition by countries like Russia and China also depends on the Taliban not allowing Afghanistan to become a hotbed for international terrorism. Instead, the Taliban will focus on consolidating power within Afghanistan. The last bastion of resistance was the National Resistance Front holding out in the Panjshir Valley. This group is led by Ahmad Massoud, the son of a Mujahideen fighter who fought both the Soviets and the Taliban, as well as Vice President Amrullah Saleh, who insists that because President Ashraf Ghani fled, he is the legitimate president of Afghanistan and therefore the one entitled to Afghan financial assets 
currently frozen by the United States and the IMF. But the Taliban has claimed victory over this last holdout. Without foreign support, a serious resistance movement is unlikely to get off the ground. However, Afghan military leader Marshal Abdul Rashid Dostum has fled to Uzbekistan with thousands of Afghan troops. Should he choose to cross the border and reinvade Afghanistan, it could provide the impetus for wider resistance. The other obstacle to the Taliban is, ironically, terrorism. The August 26th bombing of Kabul airport killed not only American soldiers, but Taliban as well. It was carried out by the Islamic State in Khorasan, or ISIS-K. ISIS-K hates the Taliban because they're not extremist enough, and it sees them as sellouts and American stooges. It calls them an apostate militia. Yet for the West, the Taliban will most likely cooperate in fighting these terrorists. In fact, the Taliban in the past already killed the leader of the Islamic State in South Asia. Yet while the Taliban may not want to support international terrorists, if they can't keep Afghanistan stable, these terrorists may still find safe haven in the country. There are over 2,000 ISIS-K fighters in Afghanistan and massive amounts of American weaponry lying around the country. It's not unthinkable that at least one can make it to the West. So what about domestic policy? Will the Taliban be inclusive of people who previously fought against the Taliban? Ethnic minorities, religious minorities, and women. Does the Taliban's softer stance apply to their hardline interpretation of Islam? The answer is probably not. The Taliban has promised to allow women to go to work and to school and to respect women's rights within the confines of Islam. The key word being within the confines of Islam. While the Taliban has done a good job keeping up appearances, their true intentions are already bubbling to the surface. In Kandahar, Taliban fighters entered a bank and ordered nine women working there to leave and said that the male relatives should take their place. Similar stories of women being forced out of work or education have cropped up across the country. Most likely, the very worst excesses will be abandoned, but strict Sharia law will still be enforced. Women might go to school, but the content of their education will only be focused on Islam and preparing them for the role of a woman. The Taliban also promised freedom of speech and freedom of the press to keep themselves accountable. In the past, the Taliban banned all TV. But today, while just 30% of Afghans have internet, over 70% of Afghans watch TV. So such a proposal could encounter a lot of resistance. Instead, the Taliban may choose to allow TV and social media but heavily censor it to show only things allowed in Islam and only pro-Taliban viewpoints. What about democracy? Well, I think the Taliban attitude toward democracy can be summarized in one clip. So would you believe in the democratic vote though? So would people be allowed to vote in women politicians? <laughs> And as for inclusive government, the Taliban has announced amnesty for those who fought for the previous government. But the new transitional government that was recently announced is composed overwhelmingly of ethnic Pashtuns, hardline veteran Taliban leaders, and zero women. Slowly but surely, the mask slips. And what about minorities? Back in the 90s, the Taliban actively persecuted the 10% Shia minority, banning their festivals and open practice of their religion. They even blew up the Bamiyan Buddhas because they were un-Islamic. It seems they've taken great care to seem tolerant of minority. In an unprecedented move, the Taliban visited a Shia mosque during the holy day of Ashura as a display of tolerance toward Afghanistan's Shia population, the Hazara. How long this tolerance will last is a different question, but pressure from Shia Iran could ensure that they are protected from the very worst atrocities. What about the opium trade? Afghanistan accounts for 90% of the world's opium production. During its rule, the Taliban tried to ban opium before resorting to taxing it, and then in 2000, banning opium again, this time successfully. But since the American invasion, opium production has tripled, and the Taliban has taken part in it as a way to finance their insurgency. Now that they're back in power, they've promised to ban it again. The problem is that opium accounts for 6 to 11% of Afghanistan's entire GDP. So without foreign aid and without opium, the Taliban needs foreign investment. Basically, in terms of policy, the Taliban seems to be going for the Saudi model. They will maintain strict Sharia law 
but will smooth over the edges ever so slightly so as to guarantee international legitimacy and allow foreign investment to flow into the country. But this raises the question, which geopolitical players will step into Afghanistan? The new great game. In the 19th century, Afghanistan was at the heart of a so-called great game of geopolitical competition between the British Empire and Russia to control Central and South Asia. It appears that the power vacuum created by the withdrawal of the United States has created the conditions for a new great game among the regional powers for influence in Afghanistan. Nations as diverse as China, Pakistan, Russia, Iran, and even India all have interests to defend in the new Taliban-controlled Afghanistan. China is likely to become one of the key players in Afghanistan for several reasons. For starters, the US defeat has been a major propaganda bonus for China. Chinese propaganda outlets have used the debacle to undermine American prestige and undermine Asian allies' confidence in America's ability to defend them, suggesting that the US failure to prop up the Afghan regime would be repeated in Taiwan. This signal could make US allies in Asia more pliable to China. As for China's interests in Afghanistan itself, they are threefold. Even before the war ended, China began engaging with the Taliban. China shares a border with Afghanistan, and so it's critical for China that the Taliban does not allow Uyghur refugees from the Chinese internment camps into Afghanistan or provide shelter to militant separatist or Islamist Uyghur groups. The other two reasons are economic. Up till now, China's Belt and Road Initiative has gone around Afghanistan, with the largest investments, over 62 billion, going to Pakistan. But these investments are under threat. The Chinese presence in Pakistan is facing increasing opposition from the local population, with the Pakistani Taliban, or TTP, carrying out several terrorist attacks against Chinese workers and construction projects in Pakistan. China may decide to collaborate with the Taliban in Afghanistan to build alternative routes for the Belt and Road Initiative. On top of that, Afghanistan possesses over $3 trillion worth of mineral wealth, including anything from gold to copper to lithium and rare earth minerals, which will be critical for electric vehicles and green energy required for the energy transition. In fact, Chinese company MCC had already begun copper mining in the Mess Ainak mine, the second largest copper mine in the world. But this was forced to shut down because of the war. Now that stability has returned, MCC and other Chinese mining companies have expressed interest in reopening the mine. China does not care about human rights or the internal affairs of nations, which suits the Taliban perfectly. In exchange for international recognition and limited investment, the Taliban will most likely cooperate with China. Taliban leaders have already stated that they will never allow any force to use Afghan territory to engage in acts detrimental to China. And unlike the US, the Chinese embassy in Kabul is still open for business. But we should not exaggerate the extent of Chinese involvement. Even after 20 years of occupation, the US failed to exploit Afghanistan's vast mineral wealth because of political instability, but also because the country lacks even basic infrastructure, making investments prohibitively expensive. In fact, the Chinese company involved in the Mess Ainak copper mine had to build its own infrastructure and roads for the mine, which made the project prohibitively expensive. So while China will invest in Afghanistan, that investment will likely remain very limited, with the main priority still being Pakistan. It's also worth considering that the US withdrawal from Afghanistan frees up resources for the United States to focus on China and the Asia-Pacific region. In fact, Biden has explicitly stated that his government's aim is to decrease its presence in the Middle East and focus on China, which would undermine Chinese interests. Pakistan has also welcomed the Taliban victory in Afghanistan. Prime Minister Imran Khan congratulated the Taliban for having broken the shackles of slavery. As I mentioned previously, even though Pakistan supported America's war effort against the Taliban, it played both sides and gave refuge and clandestine support to the Taliban. Now that the Taliban is in power, it has three interests to defend. Now that Ashraf Ghani has fled the country, there is no longer a pro-India government in Afghanistan. With a pro-Pakistan Taliban government, Pakistan hopes to build strategic depth in the event of a future war with India. Secondly, the Taliban has promised to respect its neighbor's borders, thereby mitigating the threat of Pashtun separatism. 
Finally, now that Afghanistan is stable and controlled by one government, Pakistan hopes to use the country as a gateway to Central Asia. One of these projects would be the Tapi gas pipeline going from Turkmenistan through Afghanistan and Pakistan and finishing in India. This project was originally conceived in the 90s but never got off the ground because of the war. Construction started again in 2016 and now that Afghanistan is stabilizing again, it can proceed as planned. Back in the 90s, Pakistan was one of only three countries to recognize the Taliban government and will likely be among the first to do so in 2021. This would give it leverage in Kabul, allowing it to pursue its own interests. However, there are some flaws to this strategy. The Taliban is not a Pakistani puppet and is very much an independent actor with its own interests. While it has promised to respect borders generally, just like previous Afghan governments, the Taliban has not renounced Afghan claims over the so-called Durand Line or condemned the notion of an independent Pashtunistan. It also maintains ties to the TTP, also known as the Pakistani Taliban, which continues to wage an insurgency in the Pashtun tribal areas of Pakistan. Finally, it's clear that the Taliban wants to keep its options open, working with China, Russia and Iran, thereby ensuring that Pakistan will have to compete for influence in Kabul. Russia reacted cheerfully to the news of the American defeat, using it as a threat to Ukraine. Russia has emphasized that America will abandon its allies in Ukraine just as easily as it did in Afghanistan. But underneath the diplomatic posturing, Russia is not so happy. The victory of an Islamist insurgency in Afghanistan could provide a boost to Islamists and jihadists both in Russia's Central Asian backyard as well as in majority Muslim areas of Russia. Particularly in Chechnya, Russia has had to deal with Islamic extremism and Russia will be watching closely to ensure that the Taliban does not once again become a base for radical Islamic terror. Iran has a complicated history with the Taliban. In 1998, when the Taliban killed 11 Iranian diplomats and one journalist outside the Iranian consulate in Mazar-e-Sharif, Iran threatened to invade Afghanistan. On top of that, there are serious ideological differences. Iran is a Shia Muslim country, while the Taliban is a Sunni extremist group and actively persecuted the Shia minority during its reign. But when the United States launched a war against the Taliban, Iran saw the opportunity to use the Taliban to inflict casualties on its arch enemy, the United States. After all, the enemy of your enemy is your friend. And there is some evidence that Iranian weapons found their way into Taliban hands. So Iran has played a careful balancing act supporting and opposing the Taliban depending on the situation. Now that the Taliban is in power, Iran will engage with the Taliban, but the extent of this engagement will depend on the treatment of the Shia minority in Afghanistan. One point of leverage that Iran has is its oil. In fact, as fuel prices in Afghanistan soar, Iran has already resumed its oil exports to Afghanistan. But above all, Iran is interested in stability. Instability means more refugees pouring over the border and the potential for attacks by Sunni extremist groups. And finally, there is India. India views this as an unambiguous Pakistani victory. India had placed its bets on the Afghan government, giving it support and going so far as to build the Afghan parliament. Surrounding Pakistan with a pro-India government was a key part of India's geopolitical strategy and in that, it has failed. It can now pursue two paths, do nothing and lick its wounds, or begin providing covert support to the Afghan resistance in the Panjshir Valley. The future of the Afghan people remains dark and uncertain, and as we speak, foreign leaders in foreign capitals concoct new designs for the country. The war in Afghanistan has shown that it's easy to start a war, but very hard to win the peace. Truly, Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires. How does the military industrial complex control America? Find out in this video. Leave a comment for the algorithm. Thank you to my Patreons including Linda, Richard, Eisenskjold and many more for making this video possible. Like, share and subscribe. Cause this was my take.